over the next 45 minutes, you're going to hear from three individuals whose projects are leveraging mapping tools for social and environmental impact. First up, we've got Robin Grimm, Director of Applied Research and Innovation for Climate Resilient Water Systems at Environmental Defense Fund. Robin's going to present on OpenET and how it's filling data gaps uh, for sustainable water management. So please give it up for Robin. a platform that was built to help fill one of the largest data gaps in water management. I do want to start with a little bit of context. Um, as many of you are probably aware, the western United States has been in the midst of a debilitating decades-long drought, uh, actually one of the worst in 1,200 years. Eased up a little bit with the last really wet winter that we had, um, but nevertheless we're entering into the fall now after coming off of the hottest summer on record. Generally, droughts, scarcity, water stress is increasing across the globe um, in, in so many different places. And if you live in a city or a suburb in the western US like I do, you may have dealt with this by not watering your lawn, taking a shorter shower. Uh, farmers that grow the food that we put on our plates and we eat every day are facing far greater challenges, right? They're facing rising costs, and particularly with regards to water, uh, the challenge of having to grow the food that we all depend on with a fraction of, of the water that they used to be able to depend on to grow that food. Water managers are similarly facing challenges in trying to meet the demands of not just agriculture, but wildlife and people who live in urban centers like us, and to do that also with a fraction of the water that was previously available. Now imagine facing these challenges and this reality without having a really granular and consistent available understanding of how much water is being consumed by crops and other vegetation as they grow. Surprisingly, that was actually the reality for folks as of just six, seven years ago. Um, it was really difficult for farmers and water managers across the US and elsewhere to get consistent and timely data on one of the most important pieces of information for managing water, which is what is the amount of water that's being consumed in real time by plants and vegetation as they are growing. OpenET was built to fill this huge data gap for water management. But of course, data doesn't solve problems on its own. Thankfully, there are people like this rancher that's located outside of Kremlin, Colorado, Paul Boucher, who persist every day in testing new ways to conserve water and to sustain their local rural communities and continue producing the food that we depend upon. Paul, along with other ranchers and a group of NGO and university partners, decided a couple years ago to initiate a program that was aimed at testing various ways to conserve water. And they were looking to figure out the way that they could do that um, while sustaining their livelihoods, obviously, and also while sustaining the health of the pastures uh, that they were managing. This group of folks was united in a commitment to both increase their resilience to drought and scarcity, but also to help protect really um, locally treasured fishing streams in the area. The success and ability to learn from and evolve from a program like this, though, really rests on the, in, on the knowledge that you gain from it in terms of how are the approaches working in to conserve the water that we need to conserve, right? So an ability to track how much water was used in the past, to understand in real time how much water is being used currently, and to compare that water use across those different conservation approaches that are being tested. And yet, that can actually be quite challenging. Water that is applied to a field or that falls as rain can take four different pathways. It can either evaporate off the land surface, transpire through the plants and through the leaves, or it can recharge a groundwater basin or runoff back to a local canal or stream. The first two of those possibilities, evaporation and transpiration, get combined sometimes into a term evapotranspiration or ET. And that is the ET in the, in the name of the stock, open ET. Um, ET is actually the second largest component of the water cycle, and it's the, the water that is leaving the land surface and heading back out to the atmosphere. It's no longer available for reuse, and that's really the key, because the other parts, the other paths that that water can take, recharging a groundwater basin, running back into a local canal or stream, that water is available for reuse. So ET really is a good measure, a really important measure of consumptive or net water use. Managing water without an understanding of ET is kind of like trying to manage a household budget without knowing how much money is being spent day to day. So most water conservation programs, like the one that I mentioned that's happening outside of Kremlin in Colorado, are really aimed at reducing ET or reducing that net consumptive water use. 
The challenge in monitoring that and understanding what's happening with those programs is that ET is a vapor. It's invisible and it can be challenging to measure. OpenET is an online water data platform that was developed by scientists at more than a dozen organizations to make that invisible water visible. It does so in order to help advance water management across the West and to enable programs like the ones that are happening in Kremlin to happen more easily and at scale. Monthly and daily estimates of ET are available at the field scale via OpenET and in near real time via a website and a publicly available application programming interface. This opens the door to so many different water management strategies that would be really difficult to implement at scale without something like OpenET. When Paul and other Kremlin ranchers first set out to conduct their water conservation experiments, OpenET wasn't yet available. So they chose to install ground-based eddy covariance towers as their means for measuring ET on participating ranches. The trouble there is that those towers, as they soon discovered, can be very costly and difficult both to purchase and to maintain. They can cost up to $75,000 per tower and then cost up to $50,000 per year to maintain, um, along with significant time and hassle. So an alternative to ground-based measurement, uh, satellite-driven ET estimates, like those that are available via OpenET, were also available at the time, but through private contracting mechanisms, right? And those can take some time to develop. So those were also costly, and it would take time for the results to get back to participants within the conservation program. Generally, ET information five or six years ago was piecemeal and difficult to access, expensive and time-intensive. This meant that programs like the one in Kremlin faced significant fundraising and capacity hurdles to get off the ground um, and to really figure out which of those conservation approaches work best for their community and, and represent the least cost paths forward for meeting conservation goals. So Paul and other program participants in Kremlin, they were so excited about the potential for OpenET both to reduce the cost of their own program, but also to make it so much more likely that the stories that they tell from success within their own program, inspire others to take up their own similar conservation efforts because there isn't the same cost barrier and same hassles associated with what they had to go through when they were first establishing their program. OpenET leverages Google Earth Engine, cloud computing, and other technological advances that weren't available as of just 15 years ago to make this near real-time ET data publicly available. The models for calculating ET from satellite imagery require multiple, Im multiple inputs, not just the satellite observations themselves, but also a set of ground-based observations. They're computationally intensive to run. So Earth Engine has made it possible to run several different of these ET models driven by satellite data over millions of square miles across the West. And OpenET users now can access this data in several different ways. I've mentioned two already. One is via the openetdata.org website. Um, the other is via an application programming interface that I'm so excited to say we launched just last week. Um, and that makes it possible for users to query the data based on sort of their custom areas of interest and custom reporting interests. Um, and then finally, we've also put the 2016 through 2022 data on the public Earth Engine data catalog. And our goal is to continue to produce data back in time all the way back to 1985 and all the way across the US um, over the next few years and to continue to add that data to the public Earth Engine data catalog. So going back then to the example of those ranchers in Colorado, OpenET has helped them and others in their community design and test a locally driven conservation program. And I really emphasize the word local because while our water management challenges are global, water management itself and the solutions required are intensely local. So it's really important for tools to come along that do this, that allow communities to come together and test and find the best paths forward that work well for them within their local context. We're really happy to see that there's other examples of OpenET being used in this way across the Western US already. It's been implemented into a conservation program, for example, within Oregon's Harney Basin and in other places. Um, OpenET also, that, that example that I've been speaking to is really a great one of sort of from the ground up conservation that you know, the ranchers there initiated this themselves. But there's also water managers who are trying to manage across a basin or across a district and they're trying to balance water supply and demand for that particular geography. Um, and so they may want to implement their own conservation programs or incentive programs to meet that requirement of balancing supply and demand within that basin. So for them, it's also really critical to have an understanding of baseline water use, to be able to understand the efficacy of the investments they're making in programs like that and to sort of track uh, progress against their goals at that basin scale towards water sustainability. If we continue to scale up then, um, a third way that OpenET can be used is by policymakers to more accurately track water demand and supply at larger scales, 
but also to simplify regulatory compliance and co-develop solutions with local communities based on a more common understanding of the water use that's occurring on the ground. So in the California Delta, for example, landowners are using OpenET to track their water use and report it to the State Water Resources Control Board, which is a regulatory requirement for them. And in this particular instance, OpenET represents a huge cost savings to these landowners relative to using meters or other means of tracking and reporting their water use to the State Board. Last but not least, OpenET can really help farmers improve irrigation practices and reduce costs for fertilizer, water, and energy. Gallo, for example, has been working with NASA and USDA partners on incorporating satellite-based ET data into their irrigation management system within vineyards in Sonoma. So I alluded at the very beginning of this talk when I first introduced Paul Bruchet that data is really only useful to the degree that it's applied. Well, to take that one step further, data is also only really applied to the degree that it's trusted. And so one of the really magic sauce pieces of the Google Earth Engine aspect of all of this is that by bringing all of the inputs together on one cloud-based computing platform, it's allowed the teams that are behind the models for calculating ET to work together on development of the highest quality inputs. It's also allowed them to compare their models against one another at a scale that just had not happened before. And there was a lot of lessons learned in that process and um, advancements in the science that occurred due to that process. Secondly, now that the data is publicly available the, on the Public Earth Engine data catalog and via OpenET's website and API, the ET modeling science community is in this wide-ranging and awesome dialogue now with the end user community, the farmers, ranchers, consultants, other practitioners, academics who are looking at the data, testing the data, and providing feedback. Um, and that in and of itself is also providing opportunities for advancement of the science and advancement of the way that the ensemble value is calculated. This connection between the science team and the end user community is helping then not just to build trust in ET data, but also to make it better over time. So closely related to the points I was just making, um, it's super important here to underscore that one of the main sort of ingredients to what I would call the success of OpenET is the diverse team that's been behind its development. The development of OpenET has been a community-driven effort from the start. Um, it has involved three federal agencies, seven universities, the Environmental Defense Fund, Google, Habitat7, all working together alongside dozens of partners in the water resource and agricultural communities. Several of those team members are here at geo for good I see some of you. I'm going to name you all. Will Carrera, Jordan Harding, Matt Friedrichs, Tyler Erickson, Connor Doherty, and Black, Blake Miner are all here. Raise your hands, if you would, so that people around you see you. Alberto Guzman is also here as well. Um, those are the folks that actually did the technical science and software development work to uh, make OpenET a reality. I did none of those things. Um, so if you have questions about the how, uh, they're the right people to ask. And Will and Jordan actually have a booth just outside this plenary after the session is over, so I highly recommend <clears throat> you go visit with them. They'll be demoing the API and some of the other data services that OpenET provides, um, and I'm sure will be wonderful to talk with. So lastly, I hope that there are some of you out there who work at that nexus of food and water management and sustainability who've now been inspired to check out the data from OpenET. As I mentioned, there's several different pathways for accessing it. Um, they're shown on this slide behind me here. If you do access the data and start to use it and have any feedback for us, we'd love to hear from you. We want to hear those use case stories. We want to hear your feedback. So please do get in touch with us. Thanks so much for the time. And I'm so excited to hear from Millie next. Thank you, Robin. All right, next up is uh, Millie Chu Baird, VP of Science Capacity and Innovation at Environmental Defense Fund. Millie's going to pre present how EDF is using the power of data to drive impact in climate and sustainability. Let's hear it for Millie. <laughs> Um, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about how we can leverage Google Mapping tools to illustrate how data can really make an impact. And then I'm going to introduce a new project that's launching in the first quarter of 2024. I'm hoping we'll inspire you to join and dig into the data and help make that impact. Um, I'm with Environmental Defense Fund. We're a global environmental organization of over 800 scientists, lawyers, policy experts, and economists. We work on issues like climate change, oceans, ecosystems, health. Robin actually is also from Environmental Defense Fund. 
The first story I'm gonna tell has to do with air pollution. Air pollution is a global killer. Over six million people a year die from direct exposure to air pollution of cardiovascular disease, of respiratory disease, cancer, even diabetes. That's more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. So Karen and I, okay, Geo for Good and EDF, um, about 10 years ago had a question. Could Google Street View cars be used as an environmental sensing platform? As they drive around, could they collect scientific data that could be utilized by policymakers to make policy change. And also, does air pollution vary within an urban area? Typically, in the United States and globally, air, air pollution is governed on an urban scale, like Sacramento versus LA versus Denver. And the question is, if you're gonna be driving around looking at air pollution on the city streets, does it even vary? Does it even matter? Is there such thing as hyperlocal impacts of air pollution? So if you look at the first pane here, we have this map of West Oakland. So um, Google got together with um, our sensing startup, Acclima, to outfit the cars with environmental sensing equipment, um, like nitrous oxide, PM 2.5. Um, and we also engaged with a UT Austin professor named Josh Apti. So we drove around West Oakland for a year looking at air pollution all along the way he was able to reduce over three million data points to a stable air pollution surface. So when you drive by a plume, it's interesting to note that there's an elevated plume right there. But if you're trying to make policy, what's really helpful to know is the annual average. Is it consistently dirtier in some streets than others? And that is how regulators make air pollution policy. So the answer is yes, actually. In West Oakland, Josh found that even in West Oakland, Air pollution can vary up to five to eight times in a single block. So the answer to the question is yes, air pollution does matter at a hyperlocal level. But so what? We did not stop there. We worked with Kaiser Foundation. They obviously have access to a lot of health data to overlay that on top of the air pollution data to see whether there is a correlation between negative health outcomes and this increased air pollution. Um, and then we didn't stop there. We moved on to asthma after the cardiovascular um, rates. So basically, by layering other types of data on top of novel data, we were able to come up with conclusions that matter for the residents of West Oakland. Really interesting part about this project is that I discovered that the people who advocate the most passionately and most effectively for change are those who are most impacted by the environmental problems. We were fortunate enough to work with the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, which is an environmental justice group who for two decades have been fighting for health, their health in West Oakland. They were able to take our data to different forums like the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, the California Air Resources Board. This is a picture over there of the leaders of WOEIP talking to Libby Schaff, the then mayor of Oakland, and incorporate this data along with other data um, into a community air plan and they are right now implementing that plan to reduce air pollution in West Oakland. I'm gonna change gears now and talk about repeating this theory of change for methane. About 10 years ago, our scientists, along with other scientists around the world, started to do the math on methane. Climate change policy was always done on a 100 year time frame because CO2, which is the most common greenhouse gas, lasts for 100 years in the atmosphere. Now methane only lasts for 20 years in the atmosphere. So if you look at the impact of methane and you drag it out over 100 years, it's about 25 times as powerful as CO2. But if you look at methane on the 20 year time horizon, which is how long it lasts in the atmosphere, it's 85 times more powerful than CO2. So through these calculations and other work, we were, EDF scientists were able to calculate that to over 25% of the warming in the last decade is a result of methane emissions. Methane also acts as a very short-term greenhouse gas. It's a, it has very high impact, obviously, in the first 20 years. And so as we're trying to buy ourselves time to figure out how to really reduce the CO2, it's a really important component of climate mitigation. Um, the other thing that we were able to identify is where methane comes from. You can see from the chart here that energy is about 40%, which includes coal and oil and gas. If you look at the feasible actions that we know about now, we can reduce methane by 55% with known actions. No new technology needed, no new anything. Um, and the International Energy Agency says 
that within the oil and gas sector, you can reduce methane by 75% at no net cost because gas is a product. It's better to sell it than to let it leak. Um, so as, as climate advocacy community started to get more and more into methane, EDF and other scientists really ramped up our research efforts and eventually produced a body of work, about 150 research studies, 40 institutions, 50 companies. I'm just trying to give you like um, a little bit of um, the scope of the effort that we put into understanding methane. Um, and advocacy that goes along with the science is not linear. So it's not like as soon as you produce the data, then people know exactly what to do and then change happens. Throughout the last 10 years, EDF has also been building up our advocacy um, efforts with methane um, in countries around the world, setting the stage for um, what to do when we understand more about where methane is coming from and how to reduce those leaks. So part of the research project um, that we did at EDF and GEO was to, again, look at street view cars to see whether they could help us understand how much methane was coming out in the urban um, areas in the local distribution sectors. Now, to be honest, if you think about oil and gas and the pollution it creates, exploration production, the oil wells, the refineries, the processing plants, that's where most of the methane comes from. The local distribution system, which is the, the, low, the low pressure pipes that go through the cities that bring natural gas to your house so you can turn on your stove, that's not honestly, the highest um, emitting sector. However, it does something really important, which is to bring the natural gas issue to people's homes. It says, look, you can sort of put it off in your mind, you don't live near a fracking facility, you're not near a well field, but natural gas is everybody's problem. It really impacts people, even in urban areas. Um, social science calls that salience, but um, it's, it, it was a really important factor in helping to elevate the profile of methane so that more and more people would start to focus on it. Um, so we first launched this methane mapping project in 2014. A lot went into these maps, but I'm just gonna tell you about one facet of it, which is getting from concentration to leak size. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the equipment on the street view cars measure methane concentration, which is parts per million. At any given time, how much methane is right there, which is really important when you're talking about safety. Methane is explosive, and so clearly that is very important. It should be the first thing you think about. But after that, environmental lists care about how big the leaks are. Is it a small leak? Is it a medium leak? Is it a big leak? Um, because you could have a really small leak in, in a stifled area, and you would have a big accumulation of parts per million, but if you have a big leak in a windy corridor, you really want to know and you really want to fix that leak. So getting from concentration to leak size it was scientific innovation. Um, Joe Von Fischer at Colorado State University helped us out with that. Again, data reduction, driving around, looking at the data, getting from a scientific piece of information through analysis to something that's policy relevant and policy ready. So we eventually launched in 15 cities, um, and we had over 3,000 positive media articles, over 4,500 advocacy actions, and 13 utilities across the United States are using this data. Um, but uh, interestingly, along the way, our scientists identified an opportunity. Understanding where methane is leaking from and how much really brought a lot of interesting policy opportunities. Could we design a new instrument, a new spectrometer, with increased precision that would allow us to get global coverage of understanding where methane is leaking from and how much, and also give us the opportunity to have repeat passes because over time, that is really important. In other words, where methane is coming from, how much over time. For accountability and transparency, the overtime piece is really important. So those conversations started and eventually, um, methane sat project was born. We are now getting ready for satellite launch. We're scheduled for launch in Q1 of 2024. Um, these are so, so some of the like salient facts about methane sat, which is that the data is going to be updated within days. The data platform that we are building in order to automate the processing of the information that's coming from the satellite is a key game changer. Typically, satellite data will take six months, a year to come out, but really important for reducing methane leaks is to have that data come out in a timely way. Um, that data is going to be public. People are going to be able to see it. Transparency is a really important component of this as well. Um, we're going to have a, global me a mean global revisit of three to four days. Again, if somebody makes a change in their facilities, we want it to be reflected in the data. Um, yep. 
So there are other satellites that are also launching that, uh, some of them have already launched, that are looking at methane. And we're really excited to join that ecosystem. So the Tropomi, for example, satellite looks, is a global mapper. It's, its pixel size is seven kilometers. So think of it like you can see your whole face. If you're looking at people's faces, you can see your whole face. It's a little bit blurry, but you can still see the entire face. GHG sat, carbon mapper, those are point source mappers. In other words, they're very targeted and they can zoom in really, really well and look very precisely at a very specific point. Methane sat was designed to be in between those. So not as blurry as Tropomi, not as precise as GHG sat, but you can see like your eye, for example, as opposed to just your eyeball. And so why is that important? Well, when you're looking at oil and gas, gas fields, there's a lot of wells and Based on our studies, we know that in the United States anyways, 80% of those wells are so-called low production wells. So you've, you've maybe heard of super emitters. People are really excited about super, and they're really important. But 80% of those wells are not gonna be super emitters. They're gonna be very low, very low leaking, but very significant. It turns out that they contribute over 50% of the methane from, from a field or from a basin. So remember what I said before, 75% can be reduced at no net cost. So 50%, if you just look at the super emitters, you know, you're ignoring half of the solution. And so methane sat is designed to be able to see um, the rest of the emissions. So we're gonna have three data products, total regional emissions. We are also going, I didn't mention this, from concentration to leak rate. So we're gonna be able to quantify regional emissions we're looking at so-called area source emissions. Those are the ones that enable you to see those low emitting wells as well. And then we're also looking at high emitting point sources. So um, we're working on a data platform. I mentioned the data platform. It's a key element to making that data transparent and um, to come out within days. We actually have several people here who are working on that data platform. So if you see Dave, or Ivana or Mad, say hi to them and ask them about the data platform. We're not quite ready to, to show you the data platform, but these are some mock-ups. Um, and we actually, here we go. We flew a similar spectrometer in an airplane this summer to see, to test our system, to see if it works. And we were able to get data on the Uinta and the Permian Basin. And we saw that 88% of the Uinta's emissions come from area sources not from point sources, from area sources. And over 65% of the Permian's emissions come from area sources. So if you want to make a basin to basin comparison, or if you want to look and understand how to best reduce emissions in these basins, you can't ignore the area sources, those smaller sources around the big point sources. So we're working to get this data in Earth Engine for you to do analysis. We're excited about the potential for this geo for good community and the impact you all have. So we're really excited to be share, able to share a demo preview of this data in Earth Engine during tomorrow's breakout. Please come to the breakout tomorrow at 11.30 for a demo and discussion. Thank you. Super, thanks Thank Millie. Millie. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Tim White. Tim White's the Senior Manager of Global Analysis at Global Fishing Watch. Tim's gonna present on how Global Fishing Watch is supporting sustainable fisheries through their satellite technology and open data. All right, let's give it up for Tim. Last but not least, woo! Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I agreed to give this last talk here at geo for good the last talk today between us and Cocktail Hour between a mother bear and her cubs, because geo for good holds a very special place in the hearts of everybody at Global Fishing Watch. Global Fishing Watch, our origin story, actually starts right here at geo for good 10 years ago, when Brian Sullivan from Google was randomly chatting with Paul Woods from SkyTruth about how we can use satellites to better monitor our oceans. 10 years later, Global Fishing Watch is now an independent nonprofit with some 80 staff in 20 countries around the world. So I share this not as an inspiring message, but as a cautionary tale to be very careful who you chat with at the cocktail hour, because you might work with them for the next decade. So choose very carefully, please. So what do we do? And, and why should we possibly care about it? 
um, I want to say that our oceans are really vital to all life on Earth, period. Um, and we happen to be at a deeply exciting time for our oceans, an inflection point potentially for the positive direction. So just a few weeks ago at the United Nations in New York, the world's first legally binding treaty on high seas biodiversity was signed, which is a huge landmark moment for our oceans that took decades of talking about. This really sets the path forward for a healthier future in the oceans, which matters to everybody in this room who likes breathing because our oceans produce over half of the oxygen that we breathe every single day. So you don't need to be a fisher or a surfer to love our oceans. You just have to enjoy continued breathing or at least tolerate it. Um, on that note, um, beyond this really exciting moment at the United Nations, there's also a really uh, second exciting movement that's happened um, around the world and just last year was also ratified by nearly 200 nations at the, 200 nations at the United Nations. So uh, the 30 by 30 goal, which has been, as I mentioned, ratified by some 200 nations, um, aims to protect 30% of our planet, both land and sea, by the year 2030. Um, there's a lot of progress to go on that, but there's a lot of exciting opportunities there. There also are a number of really difficult questions that we have to ask about how can we make sure this exciting momentum takes us the direction we need to be going. So for instance, which 30% of the oceans do we need to protect? How do we balance interests between conservation, biodiversity, industry, tourism, wind energy, mining? How do we balance all those to ensure that we're protecting 30% of the ocean in a way that really works the way that we all hope to, uh, in the way it works in the way that we all aim for? Today, I'm just going to share a little bit about how technology is helping to answer some of those difficult questions and how some really wonderful folks around the world have used this technology to make a difference in our oceans. So I'll start with some context. Our ocean is incredibly difficult to monitor. Um, and yet, fisheries are so vital, so their successful monitoring is key. Um, fisheries feed three billion people every year, many of them from developing nations who don't have other choices for what protein they may be getting into their bodies, and they also input some $150 billion into our economies every year. So continued successful fisheries is, is really vital for so much life on Earth. The problem is, as you can see in this picture, historically when vessels head out from port and disappear over the horizon, it's been very challenging to know if they're operating in a way that's legal, ethical, or sustainable because we just don't have eyes on them in most cases. This lack of visibility has let illegal uh, activities, illegal fishing activities, um, and even human rights abuses to thrive out of sight in some areas. So we need to work on monitoring approaches that help combat that. One of the monitoring approaches that have been used for a long time is scientific observers placed on board fishing vessels. This is like literally people who are paid to go on a fishing boat, not to fish, but to write down what the vessel's doing, is it legal, what are they catching, where are they operating? Um, and uh, yeah, that's the kind of work that a fisheries observer would do. I was a fisheries observer. This is a video that I took in the Bering Sea off Alaska on a crab fishing boat, one of those like gnarly, deadliest catch crab fishing boats. So this is a picture of what I looked like at the time, a lot beardier than I am now. Um, but it was a really wild experience, and I know that they produce awesome data, but the issue is of scale. We just don't have enough people or enough money to put a person on every single boat out there, so we need to use satellites to help leverage those insights and solve that challenge of scale. That's part of what we do at Global Fishing Watch. So this map shows a yellow line squiggling around. That is a fishing vessel that we track using satellites that record its GPS data. Zooming out further, we can see those yellow blotches are fishing fleets. Zooming out even further, we can see national water boundaries, marine protected areas, vessel traffic, shipping activity starting to come into play so that we can increase visibility on what's happening at sea. Foster transparency, which helps foster sustainability because you can help identify where issues are taking place. This map is freely available. Anyone with an internet connection can log on and zoom down into individual vessels, into a country's vessels, into waters right in their backyard to help see what's going on. Beyond just putting the data on a map, our team has built algorithms that can help identify what are the most interesting portions of those vessel tracks. So where is fishery actually taking, fishing actually taking place versus some harmless transiting behavior of a vessel going from A to B? 
Um, importantly, not only can we detect phishing activity using machine learning, we can also identify exactly what kind of phishing activity is taking place just from the signature of the vessel track alone. So as you can see here, these are three different kinds of phishing gears or phishing equipments. Um, and it's really important we know which is which because in some cases, certain types of phishing are illegal. And in all cases, different phishing equipments uh, have different impacts on our oceans. Um, so you can see from the signatures, a trawler going back and forth, dragging its net on the sand, looks very differently than a long liner, you know, placing nets that are tens or even 100 miles long, or lines rather, with thousands of hooks, versus a purse saner that's looping around in circles and, and capturing fish that way. Surely that's not me. Okay, good. <laughs> I was like, there's a chance, please. <laughs> um, uh, and so, um, yeah, so after we applied those algorithms to that data set to identify where phishing activity is happening, we don't just put that on a map. We then freely release that information in scientific papers and for download to anybody in the world who may want to use that information to address challenges of phishing in their own backyard. This was a paper that we worked on some five years ago that first released this global footprint of phishing activity map um, and first released the data sets that underpinned it all. Since that time, some 300 people around the world, spanning 60 research institutions, have published papers using Global Fishing Watch data. And I should say that I was one of those lucky recipients of this data transparency because I did a whole, my whole PhD was focused on using Global Fishing Watch data. And none of the questions that I was able to answer about how do we create big protected areas were possible to answer at the start of my PhD because the data just didn't exist at the time. So it really was a game changer for me. Now, in the brief time remaining, I just want to share a few examples of how folks have used this data to really make a difference on what happens at sea. How they went from not seeing a problem to seeing a problem to then actually doing something about it. The first example comes off the coast of Mexico where our partners, Enrique Sala at the National Geographic Pristine Seas, was in conversations with the government of Mexico about potentially creating one of the world's largest protected areas. Um, the challenge was the government was interested in protection, but they were receiving some, fish, uh, some pushback from the fishing industry over potential issues with impacts to food or job security. And, and those are two things that a politician never wants to impact, right, of course. So the, the politicians were a bit worried about that, but they didn't have information on what was actually happening in these waters. So the conversation was happening with a bit of a power imbalance and in a bit of a vacuum. Using Global Fishing Watch data, Christine Seas was able to point to the potential protected area, that red box, and show that just 2% of fishing in the region was actually happening in that box. So you could have a really minimal impact on industry while protecting an absolutely vital ecosystem. From that, the protected area was actually created and it led to one of the largest protected areas, the largest protected area off the coast of North America being established. But it wasn't just one success. Uh, National, Geographic, National Geographic Pristine Seas and others have rolled that approach out forward and scaled that up to create, at this point, seven plus major protected areas around the world where they can use data to show the potential drawbacks and really the benefits of cr creating new ocean policies. Um, these are the kinds of things we need to, I think, make 30 by 30 or things like that work for us. But, Anytime you create a protected area, drawing a line on a map is only one chunk of the battle because you need people to actually respect those laws, right? So in combination of working with researchers, working with those creating protected areas, we're also working with coast guards around the world who are using satellite data to create smarter patrols that are more effective in combating illegal fishing and human rights abuses, such as essentially modern slavery at sea. By providing data to the Coast Guard and working with them year after year on this, they were able to realize a 3.4 fold increase in the number of vessel boardings that they encountered when they went out at sea for a patrol, and more than an eight times, eight fold increase in successful violations that they identified. So really being able to more effectively crack down on illegal fishing. These are also the kinds of approaches that others around the world are using to uh, use these really precious resources, which is, you know, patrol boats are a precious resource that there's very, very few of around the world. Use those resources more effectively. Now, as one final story, I wanted to tell a sad tale that has a very happy ending. So I promise you will not go to the cocktail hour bummed out. 
Um, to start that tail off, uh, as many of you in this room know, North Korea is, um, receives UN sanctions for a, a really variety of human rights violations that has been documented there. In violation of those UN sanctions, um, China has been thought to illegally fish in North Korean waters, taking some half billion dollars of squid from those waters. And some of that money feeds back illegally into the North Korean economy you know, in violation of those sanctions. This is a problem that folks thought to exist, but they couldn't shine a light on the problem, which means you really can't solve the problem. So researchers around the world, including my colleague Jayun Park, set out to combine various types of satellite technology to reveal how many boats were illegally entering these waters and how, what were they doing there? Could we show that they were illegally fishing here? The issue with this activity, it's not just one of, hey, you're breaking a fishing law, that's bad. There's also really massive humanitarian impacts where because of the illegal fishing, the, the, the fisheries in the region, the squid stock, plummeted and declined, which means that really innocent North Korean fishers were first forced to go farther and farther and farther outshore in support or in search of food to feed their families. As a result, way too many of them did not come back home because they were lost at sea, found starving, or found dead on board their vessels. This led to what you see in the images where ghost boats by the hundreds were washing up on the shores of neighboring countries such as Japan um, with the crews deceased or missing. I am excited to say that as a result of some work that happened um, to, to identify this problem, there was a massive media focus on this issue. Um, and since then, the problem has been reduced by over 75%, where you see much, much less of this because we can actually see the problem and therefore we can address it. On a final note, I think we heard a lot today about many challenges around our oceans and around our planets, and they are all real and gnarly. But I really have to say that we're in a better position than we ever have been before to meet those challenges. So as you can see here, um, beyond just using GPS trackers, we're able to incorporate a growing number of satellite technologies that can help reveal what's happening at sea, so we can meet those challenges more effectively than ever before. Um, I should also say, towards this point, um, just recently, Global Fishing Watch has been fortunate to receive some $60 million in funding over five years through the Audacious Project, which is uh, done in combination with TED to help bring um, uh, philanthropic money to causes such as this so that we can increase this tool and increase what we can see. So not just fishing, but also vessel traffic, mining, vessels that don't display their trackers, so bring in other technologies. Um, and so altogether through this, I think, uh, we're able to more effectively meet the vast challenges that face our day. With that, I just want to thank you so much for listening and to warn you to have a good cocktail hour, but don't talk to Brian Sullivan unless you have 10 years to spare. Thank you. Where's Brian? Dead center okay, there. That's where you know. <laughs> it's, it's true, it's true. <laughs> With that, thank you again for a wonderful day, too. And Fabulous. we'll see you tonight and tomorrow. <laughs>